Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, Mel. Hello. I'm going to tilt this up a little bit just for right now. Hi. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to do a brief introduction. Welcome, everyone. Um, professor Mark Stevick is joining us um, live in person. He is a professor of English at Gordon College, and he oversees Gordon's creative writing program and directs the Prince Near Visiting Writers series. He writes fiction and essays, makes films and documentaries, and has authored a collection of poetry. Professor Stevick frequently leads a month-long workshop on ekphrasis. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Perfect. Um, poetry about artwork. He occasionally teaches courses on Nobel Prize winning literature, public speaking, and badminton, and co-leads Gordon's annual theater seminar to London and Edinburgh, where he teaches a course called Writing the City. Before joining the Gordon College faculty full-time, Professor Stevick had a mini career in radio, writing commercials, and hosting a Saturday morning kids show. As for Melanie Han, she is joining us this morning from Korea, I believe, did I say it? that's correct, right? You're in Korea, excellent, nice to have you. Um, and she was born in Korea and raised in East Africa, though she has been calling Boston home for the past several years. She's a poet, a teacher, and author of Sandpaper Tongue, Parchment Lips. Nominated for a Pushcart Prize for Poetry, has received awards from Boston in 100 Words and the Lyric Magazine. She also writes nonfiction and does translation work between English, Spanish, and Korean. As a third culture kid, the inspiration behind her poetry comes from her own childhood experiences and an exploration of identity, belonging, and culture through the use of fragmented form and inclusion of multiple languages. During her free time, she enjoys visiting new countries and trying different ethnic foods with her husband. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mark Steven and Melanie Ha. Thank you, Victoria. I'm Mel. Wonderful to see you see everyone here. Full house and um, full Zoom house, too. Carry this away. Um, so, Donde Tuta, where you're, you're in? Where are you? I am currently in the library, obviously. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm in Seoul, Korea, and you can't really see anything out my window because it is 5 a.m. Thank you for getting up. Um, it, this is wonderful to have you back to your homecoming. It's exciting, beautiful weather here. Uh, obviously, the day ahead of you, it must be a beautiful night there, I assume. Um, anyway, let's, let's hope it's a beautiful day for you there. Uh, Mel, um, what year did you graduate from Gordon? In 2016 for undergrad and then 2019 with my Master of Education degrees. Good. Master's in Ed. You might want to hear a little more about that. Um, you and I had a class together, um, so you are certainly were doing English writing kinds of things, but you majored, I think you had a double major, is that right? I had a triple major, actually. Doesn't everyone, just kidding. <laughs> well, triple, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, English, Spanish, and linguistics. Okay, right, so that, that brings in some of the folks that you mentioned in your in your book and sort of an acknowledgments page, right? That brings in Moises Park, Dr. Park, and uh, Dr. Bird, Dr. Graham Bird in our um, linguistics program. Uh, and I just mentioned your book, and that's the whole point of this conversation here. Mel, you've got a new book. I right. do, thank you, thank you. It's been yeah. a long time coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, earliest poems, so a long time coming. When did you write the first poem of this book? Uh, the uh, first in this book, go back to when? Yeah, so it was actually during your creative writing class. Um, so I guess all the way back to 2015 slash 16. Okay, so yeah, I was assuming that there were some other poems before that, but that, that, was, the, that was the first. And that's the first. And you had some, you had some great success with that poem, right? Uh, you sent it away and, and tell us about that. Yeah, so thanks to you, I found out about a competition and I submitted it on a whim and it won first place. So I was very pleasantly surprised. Uh, Lyric Magazine, is that right? Magazine. 
They are, um, they've been publishing a long time. Everybody should know about the lyric, particularly if you're a fan of um, rhyming poetry, rhyming and meter. What do you think that poem of yours, is it a rhyming poem? We, could, we should probably look at it. Yeah, no, yeah, it was kind of free verse. Yeah, so interesting. So they, they are the oldest, the lyric, the oldest magazine devoted, continuous magazine to the publishing of, of metrical rhyming poetry. And yours, a free verse, somehow left ahead of all the sonnets that got sent into that contest, I'm sure. So congrats. I hope you won $7,000, or at least a little bit. <laughs> yes, yes. If only, if only. That's great. Um, your book, um, Sandpaper Lips, Sandpaper Tongue, Parchment Lips. There we go. Um, the poems cohere thematically. Uh, tell us a little bit about the assembling of that book. How did you go from one poem to how many poems are in that book? Something like There's about 16. Um, and I feel like when it was time for me to assemble the poetry and think about ordering, um, I ended up using a semi-chronological spiral of themes and um, just different topics and stuff. And so when I was putting this together, especially when it came to the title, it was really hard. Titles are hard. And um, basically what I ended up doing was going through each of my poetry and um, looking at different lines, different titles and see what stood out. And this title comes from lines in the second poem of this collection. Right. Uh, did you have, what other, what other phrases, do you remember any of the other phrases that offered themselves as potential titles? Um, one other title that was a strong contender was My Dear Yeast. Um, that comes from my series of grandma poems that are involved in this collection. But yeah, I don't know. I guess Sam Paper yeah, Talk. Today, I, I would thought, I wonder if, if My Dear Yeast had a chance. So I, I feel affirmed. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about me today. Just kidding. Um, so, uh, Sand paper tongue parchment that comes from the second poem. I think I would love to show if you're all right with that. Can I uh, show the screen? Uh, share the screen and share your poem. Yeah, and yeah, that sounds good. I think I guess I asked that just because for me a poem has and it obviously uh, we have an oral experience, but there's also a visual component to a poem. That's true. I like line break, so it's a long line. Sure, you can't always tell that when you listen to it. Uh, is that I feel like you've been you've been paying attention to that kind of thing in this manuscript. Is that right? That is right. Let's see. For example, everybody, here's uh, here's the contents, uh, and the title comes from the second poem. But I think maybe we could take a look at waiting for water first. Yeah, and that's awesome. It's look at its form. So that's a that's not a long line. That's no Walt Whitman length line, is it? It's a it's a skinny line, Robert Friedman. So um, why don't you uh, would you mind reading this? Anything you want to say about it? Maybe we could hear it, and then we could talk a little bit about how how it turned uh, from an impulse into a poem. Yeah, that sounds good. All right, waiting for water, burning plastic, trash day, pungent acrid and toxic, just like these stagnant ponds. Finding water here in Morogoro has become tough. What had started as half a mile has turned into three miles of dragging feet. I leave dusty trails along the way with red dirt heels that have cracked like the ground. Already a snaking line at the well under the burning sun of noonday. Sitting on my empty jerry cans, I wait. First pump of water goes straight into my burning mouth a splash onto my feet, a trickle for my head. Up, down, up, down. My jerry cans fill up, and just as people behind me start yelling, Haraka, I am done. Walking home is a long stretch. Precious drops of water slosh out as I quicken my pace, but mom needs me back to start cooking ugali and skumawiki before dad returns. These cans, heavy and laden, my heart hungers for the day when the rains will fall aplenty and drown this out. It is god awful. Good poem. 
everybody here in their heart is going like this. Uh, <laughs> everybody online is going like this, which is what we do when we appreciate a poem at a poetry reading so that the poet knows we love it and that we're not interrupting too much. Um, how did it find its, its form now? And I'm, uh, so, so uh, look at that, a wending form. Yeah, so I think with this piece, it had started out as a big block of prose. I was just writing and brainstorming and kind of laying all of the words out there and phrases first. And then as I went back to look at it, I really wanted it to have a longer, windier feel that reflected the walk, the waiting, the lines, and just the length of the drought itself, which is why I ended up using line breaks and stanza breaks in order to create this terrific love it the length of the drought itself um i hadn't, hadn't put that through my consciousness thanks um do you think the poem so you said you wrote it in a block first no um yeah but you turned it when you found this form did the did you do some rewriting along the way or is it just taking what you had written as a piece of prose and lending it and finding a wending Oh, it was definitely a mixture of both. Um, so what I had written, I initially kind of turned into something that looks like this. And then I thought a lot about word choice and, you know, line breaks and things like that and rewrote some sections, added a couple more and then took away a bunch. Did you? Yeah. Right. Taking away. Um, I noticed that you don't, and I don't think you do in, in the manuscript, you don't give us a sort of glossary for some of the Korean words. Um, in sort of in what, 20 years ago, I think this, the, the standard was to have kind of a glossary at the back that you could, in, instead of being invasive in the poem, a little asterisk over to the right here, um, they have it at the end. And, and now people are moving away from that. Um, and you've chosen not to gloss these words for us. I, I, I think we can tell what it means from context. That's maybe one of the reasons you did that. But why, uh, why leave the Korean words without um, translation? Mm, so actually, these are Swahili words in this Swahili. specific poem. But there are also Korean words in this manuscript itself. And the reason I chose not to have a glossary is because I felt that it was, you know, understandable contextually speaking. And also just thinking a little bit about language as a whole um, and that sense of otherment, is a glossary really needed when things are, you know, um, able to be recognized through context? So it's just still something that I'm thinking a lot about as I'm putting together my full length manuscript. Should I have a glossary? Should I not? Um, but for this chapbook, I decided not to have one. Love it. I'm a little embarrassed that I said Korean instead of Swahili, but we'll move past that. Um, I love, uh, yeah, I love the reasoning behind that. And um, I don't know, it, there's, a, there's a dignity and a prominence of the, of the Swahili there equal to the English. Um, and I think uh, an alert reader, as you say, will get the context and there may be some things we will go, I wanna know more about, I'll look it up myself. Uh, so you're not doing all the work, and poetry doesn't want to do all the work, right? Um, for the reader, uh, we want some retain. Let's see, I want to ask one other question about this. Uh, it was a mile to three miles. Can you say anything about like, what, oh, what had started as half a mile has turned into three miles of dragging feet? So is that sort of a, the three miles of how any little kid, I assume you were little here, you think it's just going to be, a, and the task just gets longer and longer, especially as you get toward the end of it. What do you mean by that? That's yeah, that. so it's metaphorical and also literal. I don't actually remember if it was three miles. I think back then I was using kilometers and probably had no concept of distance because I was like five. But it had definitely gotten longer physically, and I'm sure it also had felt that way as well. Right. Everybody know what a jerry can what, what do those look like? They're just really big um, containers that some people use to transport oil, water. Um, yeah, just a big container. 
very sensual uh, poem full of the uh, five senses, right? Very vivid and in the body. Um, this one is too. And here's the poem that your, your title comes from. So I think maybe, can we take a look at this one and hear it and talk about it? Yeah. All right. Morogoro, Tanzania. 1999, a drought with a capital D. We prayed and prayed for the rains to fall, but it didn't for days. That stretched into weeks. That stretched into months. And I lay there on the ground with one ear against the pounding heat of the land, drowned out by the pounding of my heart. Sandpaper tongue, parchment lips, dry and cracked where life had given up and succumbed, too weary to continue. And on Tuesdays, he would come with a wheelbarrow, rusty and laden with the world. That creaking, crying wheelbarrow, searching, collecting, then carrying out a mound of skin and bones, children who at least no longer felt that thirst. And eventually his pain tore the skies back and his tears became our life as life began to spring up again, that drought ended. But I can still hear the creaking and the crying, see the image that is seared, no, scorched in my mind forever, that Tuesday wheelbarrow. How old were you? Uh, 1999, there it is. How old were you at that point? Yeah, five. And the content of this poem, as I read it, has someone coming out with a wheelbarrow to, to pick up children who have died. Mm -hmm. And that was a frequent, was that a, quite a frequent thing in, in, your, in your experience? It unfortunately was. And I think back when I was younger, you know, it was almost a normal occurrence um, that I had seen growing up. So I didn't really think anything of it other than, you know, watching the wheelbarrow pass by and being like, oh, there goes another one. Um, but I think as I got older, I reflected on those experiences. I don't know, it's just kind of haunting. Yeah, yeah. Does, um, so the writing of this poem, taking you back to that. So it, for you, it was a rigor. It was just your life. You didn't, just Tuesdays, the wheelbarrow came. Um, at some point, you began to, as you say, look back at your life and say, not everybody has this experience. Um, I assume that this manuscript had a lot of that, a lot of un uncovering things that you hadn't really thought needed scrutiny. Uh, yeah. Right? Yeah, so I don't know. I think over the past years, as I um, wrote more poetry and went through my MFA program, I really started to realize that writing is not therapy, but it is therapizing. Um, and it does provide some sort of way to reflect and um, think through emotions and the past and process. I know what you mean. Uh, I just want to say, uh, that the finish of this poem, the, the plaintiveness of these three words, that Tuesday wheelbarrow, now the words uh, are as vivid perhaps in themselves as scorched and seared. And as you search for the right verb there for what that experience was, uh, the difference between the content of, it, of the experience itself and these very plain, Plain words, uh, the Tuesday wheelbarrow. What happens on Tuesdays? The wheelbarrow comes by and it picks up children. I mean, it's just those, the distance between those two, I feel so keenly. Um, what else about this poem? So these are the words that, that leapt to become the title. And when they did, uh, did it feel, did it finally feel right? It did it. <laughs> Maybe it did. Um, I think I just kept coming back to it and I felt like the title itself acted as a double entendre physically with um, just the dryness of everything that was my childhood, but also, you know, that feeling when you can't quite get the proper words out um, and your mouth goes all dry. I felt a lot of that when thinking through language and culture and feeling like I wasn't enough and just that anxiety. Um, so yeah, it was kind of like a physical and metaphorical feeling that I wanted to capture. Right, perfect. So not everyone here uh, knows the, the TCK, third culture kids. Can you tell us a little, just 
unpack that a little bit more? I mean, getting it obviously from Tillman. So. Yeah, yeah. So TCKs are third culture kids, which means that you are a child that grew up outside of your parents' home or passport country or culture. And so in my case, um, as Victoria mentioned, I'm Korean by birth, but I grew up in East Africa. Um, and there are lots and lots of different types of TCKs, whether they are TCKs through being a missionary kid like I was, maybe being a diplomat's kid, a business kid, but also immigrants um, and immigrant kids. They are also forms of TCKs. Right. Thank you. Uh, did the book, did you at some point home in on the, the book or, or did it did it sort of present itself slowly? Did you chase it down or were you, did it emerge the way they say a sculpture come, you know, the, the sculpture's already inside the stone? I definitely chased it down because it was a part of my final project for one of my semesters during my Master of Fine Arts um, degree. But I think as I was putting this manuscript together, I realized that everything I needed for it was already there. Um, and so I just kind of picked and chose the ones that filled um, a specific theme. And then I was like, well, I guess this will be a small collection. Can you say just a little bit about that spiral? You had mentioned it early on, there's sort of a spiral structure. And I, now that you mention it, I, I think I can see it the way grandmother comes up at some point and we leave her for a bit and maybe we circle back around to her five poems or six poems later. Maybe I've just stolen exactly what you were going to say about the spiral structure. <laughs> no, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, she's an important part of the poem, um, of, the, of the book. And I, I would wonder if there's a couple of poems about her, her in which she appears uh, and speaks. Could we check out one of those? Yeah, sure. Um, we can go ahead and read that one, My Dear East. Okay. Okay. My Dear East, she says to me, everyone needs to learn. It too hard, I too old. I try communicate with granddaughter, doesn't learn language of mother because she already speak English, universal language. My Dear East, it is prize catch, mother hen, ignorance, special bond. I grab the hem of mother, watching while trembling. Show me your fertilized love giggles. Love, hi money. Hmm. What evolves? I mean, something evolves, uh, maybe falls apart from the first stanza into the second. Um, I remember a particular play I saw once where it ended in Russian and somehow the, the I don't know Russian, somehow the fact that it was in Russian, the characters were speaking the perfect thing to each other. If you'd written it in English, it wouldn't have, wouldn't have been so good. And in a way, the, the ways in which this misses is also powerful to me. Who else, where would we ever find a phrase like, show me your fertilized love giggles? I grab the hem of mother watching while trembling. So can you talk to us a little about uh, allowing this difficult and uh, nonsensical maybe, but not uh, stanza in the poem? Yeah, so with this stanza in particular, it was actually, um, a text that my, not a text, but a letter that my grandmother had sent me that was in Korean. And it was essentially something along the lines of how I needed to hold on to, you know, my mother tongue and um, be careful about not letting that go, my culture, my identity. And I think when I had received this letter, it was, it felt to me like a jumble of words. And then later on, I actually stumbled upon this again, and I put it through either Google Translate or Bing Translate, and this is what it spat out. Um, and so I figured I could maybe do something with it. And so here it is. Great, great impulse, I think, to, to include it. I, I love it. Um, and, uh, you know, the proof of the poem is in the reading or something. Uh, it's hard to talk about and maybe not even advisable to talk about how a poem makes its meaning or impact. 
I'm inclined to though just say something about the pathos again uh, and irony of your grandmother saying something intense and concerted and direct and personal to you in Korean and then it arriving in English <laughs> as this. Um, and I guess that feels to me um, representative of so much about um, what, some, what you encounter as a third culture kid trying to bring all the things into uh, something coherent in the, in the moment. How has your family reacted to, to this book? They read bits and pieces of it. They haven't had the chance to receive the full um, book in hand yet. That is to come actually in a couple of weeks. Um, but overall, they are really proud of me and were grateful about the fact that um, they, yeah, appreciate how they were able to be a part of this journey. And I think they understand that I had to kind of think through my past and learn from my own experiences in order to unpack my own self and identity. Um, but yeah, overall, they're really proud. Great. A couple of weeks, then it's being, it'll be released. So um, we can buy it on, where can we buy it? Uh, so you can order it on Finishing Line Press, which is where it was published, but it'll also be available on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, and um, other big retail shops as well. So I hope you make a million bucks like all poets. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Finishing Line Press submitted for a push card, you, I, I heard in the introduction, thing, for, uh, right? Is that, or was it a particular poem that got submitted to a, for a push card prize? That's a, that's a plum. Award. Yeah, so um, the Pushcart Prize was not through Finishing Line Press. It was actually through another publisher um, behind these shores. Um, and yeah, I was very honored to receive it. Um, and it was basically an extension of one of the poems that is in this collection. That's great. Uh, I think they any publisher has has a lot of poems to choose from or manuscripts to choose from to submit to the Pushcart Press for the prize. And yours got chosen there. That's fantastic. Um, you had mentioned uh, it's on available on Finishing Line Press. It must have been fun um, the day that you found out that, that they had accepted it. I don't know how many, how many places you sent it to. If you want to tell us a little bit about the process of finding a publisher. Yeah, so it was a long process. Um, I think I finished this manuscript in the summer of 2020, and I started sending it out, and I think I sent it out to maybe a dozen or so publishers, um, and I knew it would take a long time. So when winter of 2020 came around, I started receiving one or two rejections, one or two, hey, you're a finalist, but we're not going to publish it and things like that. So I think it was December of 2020 when I received um, an email from Finishing Line Press saying, we're going to publish it. And I was so, so excited. Um, and yeah, it takes a long time for a book to get published, apparently. So 10 months later, it is finally being released. It's great. What do you do when you, like, how did you celebrate? Uh, or maybe you don't want to talk about how you celebrate it. There you are in Korea. Uh, you were in Korea when you found out? Did they email you, I assume? No, no, I was in Boston. Um, and so I think I texted my family, I texted my friends, and I was like, this is happening. Um, but yeah, it was a really exciting moment. Yeah, um, I want to say that there are some terrific reviews and interviews on the Finishing Line Press site, right? Um, and one is from uh, the magazine Serpentine, and the editor, Ricky Barkley, asked a good question, which I want to I wanna ask you. Uh, identity is a tricky thing for everyone growing up, right? But especially when you're experiencing multiple cultures at the same time. What was the most valuable part of that experience for you? What was the most yeah. challenging part of that experience? That's your question, which I'm going to say. I think the thing that was most valuable and challenging are kind of one coin, two sides. Um, one aspect is that I think because I was able to see a lot of different cultures and learn to adapt, I became very flexible in terms of um, integration into different cultures, different um, locations. But on the other hand, I think that also meant that it was hard to figure out who I am 
Um, and especially growing up, I really did struggle with that. You know, am I Korean enough? Am I, um, you know, American enough? Am I East African enough? And things like that. But at this point, I think I've just kind of learned to accept that, you know, I am me, a combination of all of these cultures and starting to feel more comfortable in my own skin. Now there's a poem that shows different in a sort of visual way. Where is it? Um, all the some of the different places that you, there we go. What is this poem? You had spent your entire life in one home. You. That is it. <laughs> all over so well here's a the formatting of this piece is quite different isn't it from the one we saw opening with the, the one about going to get water uh just tell us about this section here and i think here again you have uh, low cows yeah so with that section right there with the countries and things they are places that i've lived in places that have had significant um, memories and, you know, upbringing periods. And they're kind of listed in order um, in terms of chronologically speaking. Um, and then Tanzania, South Africa, and Kenya are in the center because those were the most central um, aspects of my developmental years. And then the rest of this poem ends up being very fragmented, um, fragmented memories, um, constant moving, um, uprooting and disruptions and things. And I wanted to express that through the way that it was shown on the page. It's got uh, Chile, it's got Lithuania. Uh, tell us about getting to those. So actually they were through Gordon, surprise, surprise. Um, and both of them were study abroad semesters. I went to Chile because of Moises Park and um, I studied Spanish there. It was an amazing experience. And then for Lithuania, I think John Skillen is the one that was like, hey, you should check this out. So I was like, okay, I like traveling. I like checking things out, whatever that means. And so I went and also had a great time. So these over these abroad <laughs> programs are worthy. Yes, yes. <laughs> you nudge Gordon students to go abroad. Exactly. Not a promotion. <laughs> <laughs> it is called a leading question. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I did it as a Gordon grad in 86. I did a European seminar program. So some of the people tuning in might remember that launched by Dr. Franz of the history department. And we spent mm -hmm. eight weeks in the summer which was a great thing for us just because if we couldn't do an entire semester abroad, we could commit a summer. And, uh, and we did, in my case, four weeks in England, four weeks on the continent with Peter Stein and Grady Spires. Again, I'm trying to, for the people who homecoming know those folks. Did you know either? You didn't know Grady Spires. Did you? Oh. Rob constantly whistling. So a, a, a fantastic experience. Um, Chile, Chile, uh, Moises Park, can you say a little bit about how he might have contributed to your finding your way to poetry and to exploration of form? Yeah, so I actually met Moises during orientation week uh, back in 2012 when I first came as a little freshman and taking the Spanish placement exam. <laughs> and he was proctoring, I guess. And when I finished, he was like, oh, you tested out of 101 and 102, would you be interested in perhaps majoring in Spanish? And I was like, nah, I don't think so. Which is funny now because that's what I ended up doing. And as I got to talk to him a little bit more, I realized that we shared some similarities in background, you know, both Korean, both grew up um, abroad, experiencing multiple cultures. And as I took classes with him, um, he actually implements a lot of creative writing in Spanish teaching. Uh, we had an advanced Spanish creative writing class, which I really enjoyed. And he also expresses himself um, through the means of poetry and music and things. And so as I got um, to know him better, I was like, oh, this is also probably something I can try. And, and then Dr. Dr. Bird, I, I assume, had a, um, a significant impact too. Um, you, you, he sort of 
I don't know, he's just irresistible. How could you not be a linguistics major? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, your poems, uh, well, here um, we have, what's one? It's your teacher. What's that one? Miss Tam. Oh, to Miss Tranquist. Tranquist. Maybe take a look at that one. There we go. Is that all right? We take, check this one out and. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Um, let me read it for us. To Miss Tranquist. I wonder what you might be thinking, looking at the little Asian girl with dark hair and darker eyes and a sea of blonde hair and blue eyes. Your head does a 30 degree tilt as you pause at what I am sure must be my name. Uh, Hayo In? It's Kyo In. Ah, okay, thank you. Your face relaxes, mouth slackening as you move down the roster and see other names you can pronounce. And throughout the year, you somehow always seem to find someone else to call on, even when I shoot my hand up before anyone else in the class. And maybe you don't think I notice, but I'm the only student you never say hello to by name. I wish you'd try. You were the reason behind my many fights with my parents who kept insisting Hyoin was a beautiful name but I didn't care that it meant wisdom from dawn or that represented my family, my heritage, my culture, my language. All I ever wanted was to be called on without hesitation and be greeted every day by name. It's been over 15 years since I started going by Melanie, a name that means dark because that's what I am to you. You can finally say it without feeling embarrassed. I hear it often and from the lips of many people and I guess I like it but at what cost? Lots to react to here, Mel. Um, I certainly never called you Kyo uh, when when we were in our class. I, I'm not sure, I may have, let's see, your email, did it? Did your email address at Gordon have Kyo Nope, I, I think I emailed them before orientation and I asked them to change it. Okay. So I, I, probably that many of us have something like this where we wince in a certain situation where we know someone's going to mispronounce our name or some fumble is going to be there. And um, it's a relief actually if somebody gets your name right. Um, so I'm aware of this every beginning of every semester. You know, um, I should probably practice the names before class because I, 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 I don't want to fumble them. You're now a teacher. Have you uh, on the other side of this in some ways? Or are, are you? Do you have any, do you encounter students whose names you do extra diligence to, to learn to say, right? Yeah, yeah. So right now I'm teaching in Korea. So most of the students' names are Korean, which I can pronounce. Um, but when I was teaching at Gloucester High School or teaching at Emerson College, there were a couple of students whose names I would um, be intentional about saying to myself a couple times over so that I could call on them without hesitation. Um, this is so, the ambivalence, ambivalence, sort of multi-directionality of this. I hear it often from the lips of many people, and I guess I like it. Yes, I like it. At what cost? I don't. I mean, I feel like in some ways the whole manuscript is thinking about at what cost in some ways. Um, you want to say anything else about that finishing line? I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. Yeah, the whole manuscript, this poem in particular, um, you know, you gain so much from. Um, your own identity, but at what cost for some aspects of it? And so, yeah. So some of these, some of these poems don't. So that one looks like a poem. This one, not so much, unless this is the longest line since since written. <laughs> hybrid hybrid poems. What's going on with your um, sort of hybrid forms now? So I think some of them um, I wanted like a prosier, blockier feel to it. And then other ones I actually just wanted almost read as an independent short story, um, which is what happened with um, To Miss Tranquist. 
And then I think as I was playing around with form, I really enjoyed getting to incorporate lots of different structures within one collection. And so my, um, my full collection of poetry, I think it's going to continue on in that track. Full co collection underway, right? Um, underway. I wonder how many, how many pages for that? 50? I mean, are you got it? Yeah. How close are you to having a, a manuscript for a full, book, a full book? So when I was finishing up my MFA at Emerson, um, our final semester was our thesis semester, which ended up being a full length collection of poems. Um, and so mine is currently about 70 pages or so. Um, and as I was graduating, I actually won the thesis award, which I was very surprised by. Um, but I think I'll just have to take that manuscript and continue adding to it, revising, and then maybe trying to send it out there next year or so. Emerson was good for you? It was amazing. It really was. How many years was that? So an MFA program usually was three years, but I finished it in two um, because I like condensing things into a small amount of time. Speedy, yeah. Um, I've heard good things from many working students about, about uh, Emerson's program. And then you did the master's, or did you do the MED, master's in ed here first? I did. So after I finished my undergrad degrees, um, I worked at admissions. Woo! And then, yeah, during those last two years of working in admissions for three years, I did my master of education degrees. I want to make sure we have time for questions from anyone who has one. Mm -hmm. Quick, um, revision. We talked a little bit about the revision of that prose into that wine, narrow blending poem we're calling it. Uh, do poems require for you a lot of surgery or do they occasionally um, and maybe even frequently mostly give themselves to you in, in one go because you've been faithful uh, in your journaling <laughs> before, before that? I wish. Um, I think sometimes it depends. There are some poems that I end up revisiting over and over and over again. Um, and then there are some that I write and then I submit to competitions like Boston in 100 words on a whim and then it somehow wins a prize. So I think the more I touch it, well, no, I think it just depends on the poem. <laughs> I love what you're saying there about uh, on a whim. Isn't it interesting how sometimes in your case, sort of twice on a whim, you, you submitted it. I'm not sure that you necessarily had, as you said, poetry writing in your, what, in your sights, uh, and yet you submit it and boom, you get this affirmation. You've, you've got an affirmation, even from publishers who didn't accept. You said, well, they said you're, you're a finalist. That's, that's great affirmation too. Push up. So in, in a way, I mean, it wasn't, it doesn't seem like you were chasing, knocking on the door of poetry. So it came down. Um, so I feel like, I mean, we are our own worst critic and anytime something wins personally, I'm like, oh, that was probably just lucky or, oh, maybe like one particular judge could also relate to like a very specific aspect of my poetry. So it's probably just this one person that pushed for it. Um, but I don't know, I do love poetry and I really do appreciate these affirmations that I do get. Um, so grateful for all of that. Yeah. Did you take uh, intro to creative writing with, who did you take that with here? I took that with Lori Ambucker. And yeah, she also um, really helped fuel my energy towards poetry. And out of the four genres that we covered during her class, poetry probably came the easiest um, to me personally. Hmm. It's great. I'm not sure that she would say that poetry is the one that comes easiest to her. She's a, do you know, do you know her genres? Actually, she has an overlay, overlap with you, doesn't she? Some other words. She does nonfiction, right? She does. Yeah. Lots of fiction, also nonfiction about her growing up similar to you. So. Yeah, exactly. We've talked a lot about growing up abroad and her own experiences in Hong Kong and things. Um, so I think maybe that's why I was really able to connect with her. Um, and she was actually my thesis advisor at Gordon for my senior honors thesis. That's great. Oh, that's great. 
I think she lived, I think she was in Hong Kong all the way until she went to, uh, there's a college out in Chicago, Vision College, ends with a W, I can't, it doesn't come to mind. Anyway, um, and I think you, you were elsewhere, you weren't in America until, till what age? Till 17, for Gordon. Okay, wow, what a shift. I've known so many missionary kids, TCKs. How can we do better? Here's a question. Uh, it just occurs to me, um, as a college, as a professor, as friends, how can we do better for the world looking to people when you're with your back? I think, yeah, I think for um, not only MKs, but also just other TCKs or kids of immigrants, maybe um, acknowledging the fact that, you know, backgrounds do shape identity. Um, I think when I came to Gordon, I put a lot of pressure on myself to try to fit in immediately to, um, you know, the community in which I was suddenly thrown into. But it was really helpful when people gave me grace for not understanding certain aspects of American culture or um, were willing to hear about my own perspective, my own story, and just learn more about me. And so I think it just has to kind of be a two-way thing of you know, people showing interest in TCKs and TCKs also showing interest in learning to, you know, somewhat adapt and um, bring their own experiences and backgrounds to places like Gordon. Thank you. I think I think uh, I want to see what others might want to ask. Before we do that, can we hear one more poem? Uh, either can I roll slice stack memories? Dealing with a lunch. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's do it. <laughs> you want to do which one? Or the very last one? Salam. What is the, what's the title of that last one? Dar es Salaam delicacies. All right. Let's let's go to the last one, which brings us back to the start of this manuscript. Okay. Okay. Dar es Salaam delicacies. Nose pressed up against the window, I wait for pitter patters to turn to pelting poundings as hundreds of flying ants rise upward, dizzying my eyes and swarming my head. So predictable, Tanzanian rainy seasons. Dad, come on. And he brings them as always, bright yellow boots and clashing pink raincoat with words on them I can't yet read, words that mom says I'll learn in school next year. Tupperware in hand, I rush out, dancing to a chorus of wings, a flapping frenzy. Within minutes, I have plenty of the squirming creatures my prized possessions, enough to make mom proud. Back at home, the three of us busy ourselves. Dad hangs up my dripping raincoat while I tug away at endless wings, while mom heats up the stove and readies a drizzle of oil, a handful of flying ants, a pinch of salt. Sizzling in the pan, they fry quickly. Then around the table, mom, dad, and I sit, munching and crunching our seasonal snack. So predictable. Tanzanian rainy seasons. And even though I lived through many of them, I can no longer recall whether the flying ants tasted more like bacon bits or burnt popcorn. So I wait, nose pressed up against the window. I've read that poem a number of times. People in here in the room are also joining me. It's not being here. Um, <laughs> Giant sound of snapping. Um, I noticed that the tearing off of the wings. I don't know why I flipped over this line without really noticing. So you had to sort of husk them. Kind of, yeah. I, I, it was a lot simpler. I was just boop, boop. And they were so small anyway, so. So the wings, the, they go into the ether, ether and you chomp the rest of the dry. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you tell, gloss this for me? I yeah, Dar es Salaam is the city um, where I spent the majority of my time in Tanzania. Dar es Salaam delicacies. There's a lovely oral pattern there, right? Dar es Salaam delicacies. Uh, well, let's, let's see um, if people have questions. Let me check in with people in the, in the room first. And then there are people online, although I might need Nick's help. I, I, I'm not quite sure how to, to find those folks. So anyone want to ask a question of Canel 
um, from here, people in the flesh. Yes? Um, okay. I don't know if you can hear me. Mel, can you hear? This is Michaela. Kind of, kind of. You can. Go for it. Okay, so my question is, you have a lot of culture that you come from. So as far as editors, publishers, and readers go, do you find overall that people are receptive to this like complicated identity? Or are they hesitant? Like, do they kind of reject it? Okay, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, it's a little bit of both, actually. There are some publishers and editors that are really into it. And then there are also others where they've emailed me back and said, oh, perhaps this isn't for you know, this type of audience. Um, and then there are editors that actually end up fighting for my, my work, um, which shows that, I don't know, even in the US and other places that I've sent in my work and gotten published, um, there are people that will always be more receptive to it and others that might not feel like they relate. Great question. Huh? Thanks, Joe. Anyone else? Question to the middle? Yeah. Matt. This is like a selfish question, kind of. Selfish question? Um, yeah. Right. But I'm just kind of curious about like MFA programs and like the decision to study creative writing at that level and also like deciding on programs and like what that actually looks like. Okay, MFA programs. Okay, loved my time, but also I think um, there are a lot of people that get burnt out at the end of it, just because it is such an intense way to study a subject. I'm sure Mark can also talk a lot about this. Um, but what I ended up doing was I compiled a list of schools specifically in the Boston area. Um, when it was time for me to apply to MFA programs, I felt like I'd moved around maybe more than enough for the time being. So I kind of wanted to stay in the Boston area. Um, and then after that, I went and visited some schools and talked to some professors. And ultimately, um, the reason I chose Emerson is because they offered um, poetry, but also translation, which uh, is something that I do. And yeah, I don't know, MFA program, I would 10 out of 10 recommend. <laughs> Maybe not for everyone though. So really talk about it and think about it with other people. Probably also Mark. 10 out of 10, is, that's, that's high. That's as high as you get. Um, yeah, there are terrific, some really good online resources. Uh, Tom Keeley's book, MFA Handbook, um, Poets and Writers of the Handbook. Anyway, there, there are a bunch of different criteria that I think really helpful. How much money do they give you for scholarship? Um, do they have programs to get you out teaching? Do they have a great writers? You know, there's probably in 12 different criteria that you sort of use to put your calculus together. Uh, it's, I guess if they pay your way, it's easier to say, <laughs> to say yes. Anyone else question? No. Um, can we do that with other phone? Cut roll, and then we'll yes. get too much done. Is that all right? Uh, you can say no and want to read. No, yeah, we can we can read that one. Can I roll slice stack memories? Hustle and bustle of lunchtime at Myeongdong Market. Fried chicken feet splayed out and curled at the ends. Rows of hanging chilies in different shades of summer sunset. Dried whole squids piled flat on top of one another, every tentacle preserved and intact. My eyes come to rest on a little pyramid of kimpa. The predictable pattern of roll, slice, stack, roll, slice, stack. The kimpa lady is about my mom's age, same short, dark hair turning silver, apron wrapped around her once slim waist, and suddenly, I'm staring at my mom standing at the kitchen counter of the house that we lived in when I was eight and insecure. 4 a.m. she packs my lunch for a school picnic. I get up not, long, not too long after, unable to contain my excitement. Will they be impressed? Maybe even a little jealous of my mom's Korean cooking? Probably both. But when lunchtime finally rolled around and the kimbap container was opened, all I heard were the quiet eels as I felt the slight shift of people moving away from me. 
my shaking hands found themselves tossing the kimbap into the open and hungry mouth of the trash can. Their perfectly triangled white sandwiches, perfect pale skin, perfect light eyes, they looked easy enough to gouge out. Sunshine rested in their golden hair while night and fury nested in mine. Did I want to die or be white? At home that afternoon, I shut myself in the bathroom, scrubbing my skin raw and crying my eyes dry until exhaustion called my name. The front door clicked and I threw angry words at my mom. She never made kimbap again and I avoided Korean food. But I find myself in a trance, walking over to the lady and handing her a 1001 bill, receiving a roll of kimbap in return. My tongue is momentarily stunned as it remembers long forgotten flavors. All I taste is salt as I pull out my phone and dial for my mom. Thank you. Um, Victoria, were you, any, any suggestions on checking in online? Um, it looks like there's only three participants. Okay. And I think that's you, Mal, and the room. Great. So, so I don't think there is currently, yes. All the people I've been talking to online, um, they'll check it out later. Well, um, Mel, you don't need. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Congratulations yeah. on it. that wonderful you. talking about it, listening to you talk about your process of finding form and uh, the things you share, which are, are inspiring uh, to me to, to um, do the same um, to, and to invite my students to do the same. Uh, so congratulations again on, on uh, landing this and uh, we look forward to getting a uh, copy of it. Yeah, thank you so, so much, Mark. And thank you everyone for coming, even though I can't see any of you. This time we'll clap for real. Okay, thanks everyone. Mel, I'm gonna stop the share and then end the meeting, right? Yeah, of course. I have this for you, Professor Stevick. Thank you very thank you. much Thanks. for your time today. Thank you so much, I got, Mel. I got this. If it's shareable, I'll, I'll give, give me your address and I'll. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Mel, as well. Thank Thanks. you so much. Talk to you soon. Thank you.